All right, Ecclesiastes 10, let's call this one Hope in Our Way, when we are really talking about ways in which we don't want to ruin the hope that we can have in certain times in life when we might have been at a low point, only to get in our own way once we have been blessed to get out of a low space. And so in three ways in particular, and then a few miscellaneous ways, he's going to talk about the ways in which we can stay out of our own way once we've been bailed out of a jam. And it's going to fall in, like I said, roughly three categories. First of all, going back to that issue of folly, understanding the way that being wise can help us stay out of our own way. So we talk about once again, in terms of understanding the king, the ruler or leadership, ways in which we can stay out of our way or our own way. And then finally, he's going to talk about work. There are some things that we can actually do to work smarter instead of allowing work smarter to be a metaphor for just working less. But first of all, the first few verses, actually the first four, are going to seem to talk about that issue of folly, where chapter 10 is going to seem to pick up in some ways where chapter 9 left off, talking about the ways in which a little bit of folly uh, can ruin a whole lot of wisdom, much like the last chapter ended up talking about the way in which an individual committed to doing wrong can undo a whole lot of good. Verse 1 of chapter 10 will read, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. As we said, the next four verses are going to build off of that point, talking about different ways in which we can get in our own way if we're not careful with folly. Then it's going to talk about, as we mentioned, the way in which our perspective towards rulers can help us stay out of our own way, where it reads, there is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places and the rich sit in a low place. As the next three verses, five, six, and seven, are going to talk about, as we said, the king or the ruler and the way in which a ruler can get in his own way by promoting folly when there are actually capable people available. As we said, he'll go on to maybe skip a verse and to talk about in verses nine and 10, the way we can get out of our own way in work if we realize, one, the dangers in the workplace. Not ignoring them can keep us from losing valuable time to recovery. And more importantly, we can also avoid losing valuable time by making sure our equipment is in a healthy condition, not being pressed so much to meet deadlines and get things done that we neglect to realize the way in which sharpened tools or good equipment can make our work much more efficient. But this chapter is going to go back through those same three topics when in verses 12 through 15, it's going to go back to that issue of folly. This time in two of the three passages devoted to that issue of folly, it's going to talk about the ways in which once again, we can get in our own ways by the way that we speak without thinking. Beyond that, it is going to go back to the issue of the ruler in verses 16 through or really 16 and 17, when it's going to talk about the way in which the land is actually in Woe when the king lacks maturity and the princes put leisure before work. However, when the leader is genuinely noble, it's going to seem to say, that's my interpretation of a uh, son of the nobility. When it says uh, he's a son of the nobility, it seems to be saying when he is genuinely noble and uh, the princes are actually feasting because they are working hard, then the land can actually justifiably rejoice. As it's then going to give a final verse to that issue of work in verse... 18, where it's going to go back to that issue of uh, just don't forget to work. Because once again, if you neglect to work, sloth will overtake the progress you could have been making. Once again, torpedoing any hope that you might have had through a second chance by simply neglecting the things that you need to do to move forward. Beyond that, though, there are assorted verses that can also give us some wisdom about how to get out of our own way. And some of those might have actually caught my attention more than any other thing I read in this chapter. When, verse 4 is going to say, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest, which seemed to be an interesting way to conclude that first section regarding folly, understanding that that first line or the first verse talked about the ways in which a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor, which made me think, who among us is perfect and never makes a foolish mistake. And so understanding that there are times when the things that we do, all of us have the potential to ruin whatever wisdom that God has given us. But the remedy that he seems to be offering in a situation where our own actions might have actually gotten in our own way is understanding how to be calm under pressure and not to panic in situations where simply being calm can help resolve the issue. 
Beyond that, though, he's going to talk about a verse that we skipped, a verse around which, in a lot of ways, the chapter may hinge when it talks about, in verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall, reminding us of the famous saying, if you dig a ditch, dig two. If God has given you a second chance or a renewed lease on life, you may not want to get in your own way by scheming against others. Understanding that the ditches we dig may be the ditches that we fall into. And finally, one of the classic ways that we can get in our own way is once again with our mouths or the things that we say. When verse 20 says, even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom, curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice or some winged creature tell the matter. A super interesting verse written thousands of years ago that seems to matter more than ever in an era where your phones are always listening. But it also goes back to a principle we saw in chapter seven that says, be sober when you hear uh, the things that might've been said about you that might not be so complimentary. More importantly, be careful of the folly in eavesdropping. As chapter seven, verse 21 is going to say, do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Understanding that there is a huge double standard in being angry at somebody for offering the same type of criticism that you might have offered to others in a situation you might have just forgot. It's even worse if we go looking for that information through eavesdropping only to condemn ourselves by responding to words that actually might not be any worse than words that we've spoken to.